outro cast. Hey, Justin, can you hear me okay? Yeah, how you doing, man? Thumbs up there. Are you? Good. Doing great. Good to see you. Likewise. Dialing in from Los Angeles? Dialing in from Los Angeles, my friend. Somebody's got to. Well, I do appreciate you taking the time. It's been quite a few years now, but Trick Gum is the new project. Is it a band or is it a project, first off? It's a, I mean, it's a, it's, it's hypothetically a band, but it's a brand. We kind of set out on this like thing and we were, me and my cousin just kind of like, we're like, no, I feel like bands kind of get screwed and brands get screwed a little less. My, <laughs> and it's kind of fun to, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, just like, you know, be able to sort of I think there's more to us than just music since we were kids and stuff and being able to sort of make products that go or like you know that that's that scene in space balls is kind of a merchandising <laughs> Murray exactly yeah. so we're just having fun with it you know seems like uh we just have lots of ideas I think the whole idea of being a brand instead of a band and the how how it kind of sounds like you know it, it all started um making sense to me when I was talking to Jordan and I was like you know man we really need to get the brand back together you know and that's kind of the idea of the the irony it sounds like you know we can't really pr like five-year-olds I can't pr pr uh, pronounce the the word br uh, band um so it's I mean I really enjoy playing in a brand with my cousin it's fun <laughs> I do I have it correct that Hurts to Be Ahead is the second official song that the public can hear from the band or brand, mm -hmm. should I say? Yes, band, brand. Yes, uh, Hurts to Be Ahead is out now. That's the second one. And we got another one coming next month and uh, with a single, uh, with a video. All of our stuff is kind of going to be like visual. Um, <clears throat> have come along with visuals because um, it's a brand, you mm -hmm. know, and... Uh, we're just the, the, you know, the music for the commercial. <laughs> Fair assessment. It is a very vulnerable, lyrically speaking, very vulnerable of a song. Did you have any hesitation as a spouse, as a son, as a father? Did you have any hesitation to actually putting that kind of lyrical content out there? Uh, you know, I've always been somebody that's kind of like, more hesitant and nervous about other things like flying through the air and airplanes. <laughs> uh, and uh, I don't know why I, I, I feel like, you know, occasionally there's a, a side of me that like does sort of like the ego check and you look within and then you might feel weird for a day. Like, man, I'm a piece of shit or I'm this, but I've never really cared that much. I mean, obviously I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings or anything, I don't really care that much what people feel about me as far as like my wife and my, she knows, you know, me and the things I deal with. And I, I, I wrote that song, me and, um, me and Jordan had watched this when he was out here for Thanksgiving, we had watched this amazing, uh, documentary that was probably one of my favorite documentaries I've ever seen now, uh, which is called, uh, uh Jodorowsky's Dune. I don't know if you've seen it. My wife uh, is the Dune person. There's a Dune soundtrack over there on the vinyl shelf, but I have not seen this one. So this documentary is basically about Jodo Jodorowsky's doing, which he never got to make. And it was just like so inspiring. He came out to the studio that night um, and wrote some piano stuff. And he just like was sending me voice memos. But I went to bed because I was getting up early kids and stuff. And I woke up in bed and like um, I was like, oh, shit, this is good. And I was just listening to the voice memo. And I just started take. I just like took my voice memo and just started like singing melodies and writing lyrics to it because I felt something. And um, the kids were like screaming in the background. It was like six a.m. I could hear them screaming while I was writing it. And yeah, just the idea of kind of like, you know, that song I thought was about me, like saying like I wish it was like this. While I started writing it, you know, I was like I wish. You know, I wish I lived somewhere uh, quieter, that I had more space like I was used to, like growing up on the East Coast and Long Island's a bit different than L.A. and prices are different up in Is New it, Hampshire. It seems what? like all of Long Island moved out to L.A. <laughs> I know. And like, you know, it's weird. It's like I, I moved out here for my job and, and Ashley, my wife uh, at that time, and we're to do music and stuff. But I miss 
I think my eye, just because the way I grew up, that's where I grew up. It's just my relative experiences like in Long Island. And there are obviously lots of different areas of Long Island that look very different. Yeah. But, you know, there's more greenery, suburban ish vibes in long island than there typically is here with all the streets and you know it's different and i mean you go to our areas like pasadena or something and it's like you know kind of almost feels like garden city or something yeah. to a degree but like that and also growing up largely going back and forth to where my whole extended family lives in new hampshire that's kind of like what my eye was programmed to sort of you know feel comfortable looking at and being in and out here is like you know it's it's actually i i'm more i think at the at that in my heart i'm a more of an east coast kind of guy in mm -hmm. general and just in just because it's where i'm from so that song was kind of this like you know wanting to kind of like have this space and i mean my our lives are here and she's got a family business and there are these things that you know it's like i want to go back to out here with this house i mean it's not even a big house but out there we could have 200 acres so it was like you know this sort of idea of like and just dealing with all the stuff that's kind of Los Angeles, AKA Hollywood music industry present being in your face constantly. Um, and just kind of like being Faust, like the German band from the seventies and like chop wood in the forest and be like, that's a cool sound, man. Let's go like record that. And, you know, I just have like, you know, that kind of space. And then, but the whole point of the song, as I was like complaining kind of throughout it, is then I started calling myself out and being like, well, quiet's gonna be weird too, right? At first, it's gonna be fucking quiet there. It's gonna be no fire, it's gonna be a whole other thing. So it's kind of turned into like a grass is always greener song. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Cause like, yeah. that's the, I think that's the main thing with humans that like, is like the, the main struggle is like, we're leaning, we're leaning, I mean, I don't think, the people who cannot can like not lean into life into the next moment are like the people that are going to be happy, which is probably it's extremely difficult. I'm not saying I can do it, but yeah, you know, at moments, moments I can do it. But, you know, not looking back, not looking forward, probably a better place to be. And that's kind of what that song is about. And the cool thing was that uh, about that song, though, is uh, for me, was that like three people that were close to me thought it was about them. But it was really about me. And I was like, no, it's not about you. It's about me. But I guess it's about you too, though. Because, you know, who knows? I could. It's like all coming from me and these people are very close to me. So their, their uh, experiences are also kind of like, you know, um, in my peripherals and, and in, in my subconscious as well. So it's, I was just like, I guess this one's the song for everyone. I really like that song because I feel like it's honest. I like that I didn't. You know, yeah. there was a temptation to add drums, but I was like, nah, it, I could have added harmonies very easily. It's like, nah, just like listen to the song. I almost feel like it's like a, an adult suicide song. Like, uh, like it's like for those people who don't, and I'm not saying that I don't have, I have like my own, I think most people probably have mental issues. I have my own mental issues. Um, but like, I think that like that song was like a domesticated sort of suicide song and and hmm. might strike the people who hear it someday, you know, like, oh, shit, man. Like, I know exactly what you're saying. Like, I'm not actually going to kill myself, but I really don't wish I was alive. You know, like so that feeling that I think all of us can at times certainly feel in moments of like, just like the chaos of normal life. And then, you know, the world's just in, the world's always in a weird place in my, in my opinion. It just happens to be our time. And this weird place that we're in right now, you know? Yeah, totally agreed. Well, ch changing up the course, you did say Long Island, and I, I put you in this category of Long Island people that are su super successful in music, yet Long Island never really did anything for, that never took in as its own, that you would say, hey, this person, you know, do you know Justin? They go, no, who's that guy? Yeah, they're going to keep talking about Billy Joel and Dee Snyder and Taylor Dane and all that. So I, I say there's you. I say there's your buddy, Dan Nigro. Is he Daniel or is he Dan? He's Dan. I mean, to me, he's Daniel or Dan. To me, he's Dan. I actually saw him the other day. He came over since it's been so like hectic with him uh, just processing that everybody would say, oh, oh so oh, oh Dan, 
oh my God, whoa, it must be so incredible. But to be in his position, I had to process it myself too, being so close to him. I had a, you, but it's not, it's like, it's cool. It's awesome, but it's like a lot. So it's like, you know, like for him to be doing well. So we just finally met up the other day and like, kind of like, qu- qu- didn't necessarily celebrate it, just had a couple smokes together and just discussed like the chaos and just like, you know, we're friends and cause that's always what we've been. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really happy for Dan with what happened. And, and I think that, you know, it's it, it, that kind of stuff opens your eyes to um, the kind of stuff that is going on out there and, you know, what success quote unquote is uh, to each their own, you know, that's the thing is like, Billy Joel, I mean, to thank you for uh, comparing me to, you know, Twisted well, Sister and Billy well, Joel. I can say more names. I can cut you off and say, like, Dan Deacon, who is from Baltimore. Yeah. Right. No, he's not. He's from Long Island. There's him. There's Jeff Rosenstock from ASOB, who you used yep. to know and play alongside. He's not from Long Island, per se. He's from Brooklyn. And I, I think he's out there in L.A. now as well. You have all these people from Long Island that cut their teeth playing gigs on Long Island, yet this area never really embraced them on the level of those artists are brand new. We're taking back Sunday who are from Long Island. Right, right. <laughs> so it's it, might, it, might have, it might have been because we split, but, you know, I mean, maybe it's because we split and they're like, who are those guys? Fuck those guys. They went to L.A. But the funny thing is, I mean, that's 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 if I'm going to think about it in like a David Foster Wallace sort of like way, like, uh, this is water. I don't know if you know that thing that he's that's interesting speech he gave, but like, I don't know. Like I, that's, I, I did. I mean, Christian McKnight was my guy, man. I mean, and he's, he is Long Island to me, you know? And he, I think like, to me, that was my experience. Like, I mean, I obviously know you from the past and Rafer, you know, I did the Rafer interview when the Dan, when Dan, the Olivia thing happened with Dan, which was uh, cool to talk to Rafer again from Newsday and stuff like that. But I mean, maybe they were more, maybe the people like Jeff, I mean, Jeff really stuck to his guns. Speaking of Jeff, because I know Jeff, I mean, I haven't spoken, and Dan, I know both of them. Uh, I haven't spoken to them in a while or seen them or in a while, but I mean, we were playing shows together. We talked, I mean, you know, uh, Jeff, but they, I think <clears throat> maybe more so Jeff than Dan, but I feel like the cool thing about Jeff is that he really, and I always said that, like when he started doing good, you know, like where it became more popular in the last years, uh, uh, you know, across the country. I was like, this is so cool. He like literally just did not change. Like he was like, fuck you. And now like all the music that's actually becoming popular with younger kids sounds like what he decided he was just going to keep playing because that was him. Yeah. You know? And it's also different. Like the people you're talking about are artists, you know, so maybe Long Island will give Trick Gum some support since it's an artist sort of thing versus, you know, the producer writer thing is very like, I can see Dan now maybe getting some support because he's at the top of the charts, which is something different than experiences I've necessarily had. I mean, I've had some, you know, interesting stuff with the, you know, the whole Lizzo thing. It's not like I haven't been in situations that I've had songs that are uh, via like commercially successful, you know, or whatever. you, You have had success to the point that I would hear a song and go, oh, that's a good song. And then I look and go, Justin wrote that? That, that happened a few times. Uh, well, that makes, so- me, that's very, makes me feel happy. That <laughs> makes, the, the best part of that sentence that you just said is, oh, this is a good song. And then you look who wrote it. And then you said, oh, that's Justin. Because the success level, I guess like that, that's the whole thing that I'm, I'm struggling with as I get like, just, you know, we're all getting older in our own, you know, age groups and, um, every day whether you're 20 or 10 or 5 or 30s like me and it's like um like i i just i'm like confused and the dan thing was like an eye opener because like what is success like he's like my boy my main went to kindergarten with him right like i think i met you through him going hey this is justin you should check out his band in 2002 2003 something like exactly that. we even went to fordham together accidentally for two years like college yeah. um and you know i think that seeing him go, i mean and also then he didn't want to do the band anymore and then he moved out here and i introduced him to all my people and taught him how to do pro tools and he already had all of his own talents but i taught him how to kind of 
take those talents and focus them more towards what he's doing now, mm -hmm. which isn't necessarily being a writer for your own band. It's different and produce and meet people. But I mean, so like success, you know, obviously in our world is basically seems like it's like weighed for most people on like followers and metrics plays <laughs> and money plays yeah. money influence so i think i would be successful if i were to say i was successful which i i guess i am successful in the way that i do something that i like for a living and i'm able to sustain myself doing it sure uh, that that would be my success and 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 uh uh, you know, and then, and then the cultural part, just like, you know, uh, just reaching people. Cause I'm not, I'm not a rich man from this, you know, like I'm not a rich, you, you're not, it's funny that all the different, like, you know, you could probably watch a Netflix show for instance and go, Oh, oh that actor. And then all of a sudden you're watching that Netflix show and it becomes your favorite Netflix show. And that actor is the lead actor. And you hadn't seen him before you watch that Netflix show. And you're all of a sudden, picturing this actor who's living in this fucking palace well me meanwhile he probably just has like an apartment in his company you know what i'm saying it's just yeah. like so smoke and mirrors in dan's situation it's going to be quite different because he knocked all the rappers off the charts you know what i mean so this is a new this is new territory um and and it made me look at well what is success because i'm looking at dan and i'm looking at me and it is part of the it's part of why i came back to start being like well, Jordan's been like my soulmate collaborator since we were kids. We're two days apart. Um, and we just had a lot of feelings and thoughts with the last bunch of years. So we were like, let's like do this shit again. Cause this is where it all started. I mean, I was doing the band by myself for a while in Long Island, but then he joined in our early twenties. And then I was like, and this is kind of always part of the plan uh, in my mind was to do what I do because, and then come back around. Cause I mean, I am first, uh, a songwriter front man sort of band guy you know performer uh that's my the first thing i was and and uh and that and i think that could be a reason why sometimes i'll do work on a couple of records and we'll make a couple of records with a great artist and then sometimes maybe they i don't even have like a necessarily a falling out with somebody or something but they need to go off and do something else without me even if it's going well with somebody else because there's like an aspect of me, like almost being like, it might be a little bit sometimes for a specific artist, like too much to do, like maybe three records in a row with me because they're like competing with an artist that is not that I'm taking over their creative process at all. I mean, I'm, I'm just part of it, but it's that energy that I have. I'm jumping around rooms and well, shit. To, to pause you there. I mean, Ted Templeman did the first, I think six Van Halen albums, but who does that happen with anymore? Who works with the same producer for two albums in a row? So that's not a knock on you. Yeah. Like Weezer, every album is a different producer because they go, hey, we've never made a blank album before. Yeah, let's get that guy. Exactly. And I think most bands are at that point. Maybe the Flaming Lips are the only yep. people that always use. And Radiohead, band. Radiohead, obviously, with, with Nigel. Nigel, yeah. uh, And the Beatles were pretty consistent. <laughs> pretty You're consistent. Right. Until they but, started self-producing and then they let um, exactly. uh, uh, Phil Spector in on the Let It Be stuff. Exactly. <laughs> but it was fun to do. The two Eve Tumors were fun. That They were fun records to make with him. Um, I think he's making some music with some other people right now. But they, I, I, I was enjoyed making those two albums together. Uh, interested to see where he goes next. And then, you know, I mean, there's a, lot, a lot of the albums, my most favorite records that I've made I think we're definitely records that, you know, there's just an energy between the, um, an excited sort of, it almost feels like you're, when I start to feel like I'm almost in the band or something, you know, like not that I, it's not, it's not, I'm not the artist. I'm just kind of in it mm -hmm. is, uh, is fun is, is when it really becomes fun. And I think, you know, also working at a pace that is, doesn't drain the energy of, the art that is happening because I think people honestly, I say I will keep saying it being a producer and it's not me being lazy. Um, it's just like people spend too much time. And that's like one of the goals of Trick Gum was I was kind of just like thinking about different bands, different artists, having the brain I do, listening to music and being like, you know what? I'm just gonna fucking do this and like put shit out whenever I want. And I'm not gonna have a label make me suck a single drive for nine out, like, you know, some 
fucking nine months and like i get how it works i get all the infrastructures behind streaming and promoting and influencing and all the crap that goes on but i was like you know that's not my purpose here my purpose here is to actually with my new thing uh because i i don't even say this like in an egotistical way it's just like me and jordan have like not only like 30 to 40 new songs um that we've done in like the last four or five months but there's hundreds of songs that are like, like, you know, how like Radiohead will release nude and, you know, whenever they did in 2016, but they had it since the nineties, you know, we have like such a crazy back catalog of stuff that has been released that we like. So it's like kind of never ending. So we're just kind of like, why don't we put out like a bunch of, they could put out a song every month. And like, you know, we were really excited that Jonah Hill, like reposted hot, hot yes, rifle. Yeah which was super cool for us just because we were like, that's cool, man. Like early, just putting out some songs to get somebody like, you know, cause we're just fans of him too. Like he's a fucking awesome, funny actor and, and he likes cool shit. You know, he seems like he likes what I think is cool shit. And uh, so that was really cool. And then I like thanked him and he messaged me, which was really cool. Um, so to see any sort of, um, you know, uh, kind of, forward movement in that way with our own stuff is exciting and i just feel like we we have things to say you know you have things to say that we needed to mm-hmm. say that aren't necessarily we're not even driving home a point we're just trying to um reach people so they can like i don't know just escape and be in the moment with like music and art and not have to think so much about why <laughs> do you ever talk long island with jonah hill I didn't. I mean, I, I didn't really talk to Jonah much that long. I, I mean, the fact that he posted it was cool. I was just like, thanks, man. That's so dope. And he was like, this song is dope. And I had written him a message a few years back about that. I can't think of the name of the movie right now with that he was in walk with Joaquin. Sorry. Uh, I can't think of the name right now. Something sorry. Sorry is in the title. Mm-hmm. And then when I'd seen it, I just like messaged him like out of the blue, like, yo, you were awesome in this. Like, just wanted to let you know, like thinking he'd never see it. But he ended up seeing it because he posted my song. He's like, thanks for the kind comments above, which were like two years ago, you know. But um, so, you know, that's it. I'm not going to like bother Jonah Hill. I mean, he's like a busy dude. I know what it's like. I'm saying like on levels of feeling anxious and sort of like having yeah. all artists of different sizes come in here and even actors that have been in here. You know, Kristen Stewart has been in my studio at one point, like just not to make music. She just happened to be here. And you see the different levels of, you know, the walls that people start to have to put up and like the amount their phone is like strobing. And at a certain point, you the, you can do the whole like uh, stereotypical cliche, like, oh, poor me, I'm successful. But there's, as a dad now, I really wouldn't want my child or children to be like, if they really want to do something like make music or something, I'm not going to be like, you're not allowed to make music. But I wouldn't like really like be like, you got to go into entertainment. This is where mental health exists. Yeah. This is where your best, you know, uh, you know, existence is going to take place. Cause I just, I, do, I truly don't believe it. I mean, I'm a movie lover. I'm a lover of art, but I, I, I think that like, you know, and I think some people figure it out. Like there's certain people that at least from the outside have like a calm, a calming effect of, of it being possible to do it and still be happy like a david lynch for instance makes me always feel like this guy seems like he's at peace and just enjoying his art that might just be his meditation regularly yeah. because him yeah. and al jardine and all those people that the foundation that could be his thing though but it, yeah, you're sure. right the, when when art is the only thing that you're doing all the time and then you're listening to music for fun when there's no divide between your work and you know your personal life it's a recipe for disaster but yeah, it's hard. So that's why I mean, when I when I I run a lot, like run and like I realize sometimes I'm like li- like listening to music, and then I'm like, ah, I know what I'll do. I'm listening to music with lyrics. So I listen to mo- I can't do that 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 often. I'm usually running to like the Phantom Thread soundtrack or like some like crazy, uh, you know, '70s '80s instrumental record or jazz mm-hmm. or classical, and that's like nice to give the lyrical sort of conceptual brain arrest because that's kind of always in flux and never stops and i'm also sort of like 
I'm a business kind of guy. I'm not like, I'm not a business man, but I'm saying like, I'm very business oriented in the way that I think about things. So there's like, and that's the crazy thing about being a producer is like at a certain point, you're dealing sometimes more with business than you are with making music. And then you're like, right. what the fuck am I doing? This is like stupid, you know? So that's so why I was like, have- I'm going to trick them. I got to at least find some, not that I don't enjoy working on people's records, but there's so much bullshit that comes along with that. Yeah. While in trick them, I don't have to deal with that bullshit. I, we're putting out the records ourselves. Me and Jordan decide if we like it. We make the art. We put it up. We make the release date. There's some bullshit, sure, that you got to deal with. Like, oh, we're going to come out this day. Let's, you know, send this to our publicist and all that kind of crap. But like, really, we're finally just getting to be like, this is hot. Putting it out. There's not like 7,000 conversations and, and we work fast, you know? DIY-ish. Uh, before Basically, I ask the last topic that I'm curious about. Crypto rock, baby. <laughs> You don't run to the Rocky Four soundtrack? Oh, man. I haven't yet, but maybe I'll do that today. Yeah, they, they, there's, there's some lyrics, but you'll thank me later. But the last thing that I wanted to know about, and I don't know if this is a 10-second answer or mm-hmm. a 20-minute answer, you be the judge uh, on the timeline right here. And it's going to start off with a compliment. And that's one of the remarkable things about you in particular is that you're not just a great songwriter, but you were always willing to pick up the phone or reach out or solicit or talk the business end. You find a lot of people that are great songwriters, but then they're shut-ins with the social end. Like they need that person to do it on their behalf. And then you see the exact opposite. You don't see a lot of the two, the creative person that's also good at business. Now, in your case, when did it all start to turn around as a co-writer, producer, outside guy, do you remember which album or project it was that you started to panic a little less about the work coming in? Oh, you mean like as far as like it being consistent? Yeah, because for like, example, you did a lot with Sky Ferreira. Right. That was awesome. Who knows? Right. Who knows where that went per se? But right. I'm sure people went. He worked with Sky Ferreira. Wow, I want to hire him. But the thing is. The way that ASCAP royalties come in, that takes oh, a bit. Oh, uh, it oh. is so scary. It is scary. I feel bad for everybody. I really do feel bad for everybody. And that's why, like I do, man. I, I, I have a, a freaking soft spot for the artists, especially ones that, because you have a lot of people who are in situations that honestly, they don't, they don't need money because they come from it or something. Like there are, and, that, and that's a whole other head fuck for them to deal with. Because it's uh, every single version of this is it has its own complexities but like i feel that as far as your question goes uh i mean i was like out here doing the band in like 2008 9 and then we were doing like you're partying and then it kind of became no fun and then you know jordan started another band and then i started doing more more writing in mind for other people with ariel you know rekshai just like writing different songs for him and stuff and i think i the first song that I had like kind of written that got cut and like added to, but um, was um, Theophilus London, Why Even Try, I played Letterman. It was like my first taste of like, oh, I'm a co-writer guy now. And um, and then at that same point in time, I was doing Charlie XCX True Romance, which is like my first, like I wrote like, co-wrote half that record um, and was making a lot of demos at home and then sending them to Ariel. And um and then we did the Sky record. And then that was kind of like the sort of like, okay, Justin's doing this. And I think that taking a chance on the Sky record and then Sky being such, uh, in my opinion, still, but just such an interesting and awesome artist and just like wild. I mean, I don't know if wild's the world. She's just an icon in her own sort of within rock. And just, uh, you know, I think that that kind of, I didn't really work with that kind of like exactly like he said, sort of push people like, oh, he did Sky. And then because she was just like, you know, kind of like the epitome of cool within of in that stage that was like somewhat mainstream, you know, like left of mainstream, but, you know, popular enough that some people knew who she was. Um, Popular enough uh, that when MTV had the Palladia channel, you'd be flipping through and go, oh, Sky Ferreira concert in Malta or something. Exactly. Like, that. like you know, it was like it was it was it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't the smell, 
you know, which yeah. is had a lot of great bands came out of, but it wasn't the band opening at the smell. It was, it was, it was getting some traction and billboards yeah. on top of Amoeba and stuff. Um, and then after that, what happened next, I believe, was that I, me and Charlie never really worked together. We just had met each other when she was young. Mm-hmm. She's like, uh, yeah, I think we're like eight or nine years apart. And like, so she was a kid. She was like 16, 17 during True Romance. And uh, we hung out, but we never really worked in the studio together. She was just like working on stuff that I had worked on with Ariel. Um, <clears throat> so 2014 came around and I actually worked with her, like with my brother, Jeremiah, too. Um, and uh, we did a couple songs. Funny enough, he mentioned Weezer earlier. Rivers Cuomo came over to my studio for one of them because he had co-written one of the ones I finished the production on. And that was kind of fun. And I feel like the Charlie uh, Sucker record was kind of when like it all began like, OK, this is like happening. Like, you know, as far as like this is now my job, like this is working Charlie into the re working with Charlie on her second record Sky into reworking with Charlie on, on, on Sucker was the beginning of like, I guess this is what I do now. And I'm not going back and not turning back. And then the rest feels, it's kind of funny, but it, you know, for a career, when you look back at it, like a career of people and producers and bands and stuff, sometimes I'm like, cool, man, like you're doing pretty good actually. Cause I have to remind myself, you know, everything is like relative. It's like, man, I've been doing this since I'm 18, but like, no, I've been doing what got me to do this since, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah. I've really only been doing this funny enough, like as a full-time record producer, songwriter for like eight fucking years, which is really not that long um, in the scheme of, I mean, what, I mean. Life That's like short. one gun, Guns N' Roses album cycle. Exactly. Yes. So it's not really not that long. So like, sometimes I got to remind myself like, dude, it's cool. But everything kind of just happened fast after that. Like, you know, I made the Angel Olsen record, which is cool. I work with Santi Gold. And things just started to stack up. And or actually, I mean, I know he's a, uh, Ariel Pink is still a friend. I think that people, I'm not, I'm not a, a big person for cancel culture. Um, and, and unless you've done something that's really unforgivable. Uh, so he, working with him was something that was also really helpful. A lot of people wanted to work with me because I worked with Ariel Pink, to be honest. I think that's one of the reasons Eve Toomer wanted to work with me. Um, or meet me, you know? So I feel like, you know, between Ariel Pink and uh, cause he is like, I don't know, the Brian Wilson of our time, in my opinion, as far as like his records, he's crazy. Um, he, between that and Charlie and sort of the mix, cause it was like such a mixed bag. You got Charlie XCX, who's like, you know, now a bonafide pop star and writer, mm-hmm. you know, just like God writer. What a great writer and performer. And, um, and like, and then somebody like Ariel Pink and Sky Ferreira, who are kind of like, one is way like, you know, highly regarded as a critically acclaimed artist. And one has got that critical acclaim, but still some pop side with Sky. And then you start doing something like Santi Gold, and then you enter into that Angel Olsen world. It started to be like, but then you get a, you pop, you get a pop with Joji, like Sanctuary, that the Joji song I have, which is the biggest song I actually have, funny enough. And it kind of can, I think I, I was a confusing I think part of my whole thing is a little confusing um, as far as, um, you know, oh, he does this and that and that and this and that. And like, that's the thing about me is, and that's why my band never got big. It's what I tell everybody. It's like the reason my band could have been big a couple of times. I remember Rich, uh, I mean, um, what's his name? What's uh, Richard? Is it Richard Feldman? No. Is it Triple Crown? Is it? What's his name? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Rich from Triple Crown. Right. Like he was going to sign me. He came to the last show of Brownies and. We played a whole different oh, no, set. Fred, Fred Feldman. Fred Feldman. Yes. Like Fred and, and Andrew Ellis and shit. Like they came to see me at Brownies. and Brownies, 10th and yeah. Avenue A. Wow. Okay. Yeah, we, we played with like Engine <laughs> Down that night. And uh, wow. I love, still to this day, I love Engine Down. And, and yeah. it's funny, I met those guys later down the road without even realizing they were Engine Down and then being like, you're Engine Down? It was funny. Uh, but uh, we played like, zero songs that they've been listening to and why they wanted to sign us that night and they were like what happened to all the other songs i remember having the conversation outside with them i was like oh we're not playing those songs anymore we're playing these songs they're like 
well, we liked those songs. Are you don't want to play them anymore? And then I was like, no, we're gonna play the new songs. They're like, well, if you don't play the old songs, then we don't have a deal. And then I was like, no deal. <laughs> and I did that like two or three times. And my band did not like me very much because of it. I do remember that. I remember one or two gigs going. Um, I remember seeing you at some catering hall in Bayshore. I don't know. If it's- yes. And then like a year later at Backstreet Blues in Rockville Center. Going- and we were like the Beatles. Yeah, yeah. Like, and there's tambourines now. Yep. <laughs> like, okay. That, that's kind of my, my I mean, to, to like and that that's not why what i'm about to say is not why i was doing what i was doing back then i was actually just like actually developing as an artist and i got bored quick i guess you could say like look at me now i'm doing trick i'm in why so we can release shit whenever we want because i'm gonna get fucking bored otherwise you know what i mean it's like i don't want to sit around waiting so um but and the reason I the, the changes of sound were happening was just kind of that same reason I was exploring different things and getting into different things, which led to me being able to write for many different people. Because if you wanted me to write a country song today, I'm probably not going to write one that sounds like modern Nashville because that's like a whole game. But I, I could write you one that kind of did or like a Johnny Cash song, Johnny Cash kind of vibe song, no problem. Or like, a, you know, like a Towns Van Zandt. I'm not saying I'm going to I'm not, I'm not trying to say I can outright those gentlemen. I'm just saying that I could write something in the fashion of that and have it be cool. I could write a David Bowie song or you want a pop song. And I think that comes from me continuing to be like, no, I'm not signing. I'm, I'm just going to keep playing this shit in my early days of being in the band. Then at a certain point, when we got to L.A. I really feel like we found an identity with the band. But you also have to realize that I'm a guy that loves Andy Kaufman. OK, so Long I'm an, Island's own. It always comes back to Long Island. <laughs> I'm an Andy Kaufman, Jerry Seinfeld, Larry David guy. And Andy Kaufman, especially like if you can have fun and play tricks on people, a.k.a. trick gum, but not have it be about making somebody feel bad, but maybe exciting people and making things feel like when you were a kid and like magic. Like, that's what's interesting, I think, to me and my cousin and kind of like, you know, keeps the whole hope alive of like, I don't know, like everything has gotten so like, it's always been this way. It's just everybody says, oh, the world's the worst it's ever been right now. Although, but like, no, there was some really fucked up times back in the past, man. I'm just saying, I think the world's really interesting right now because of how connected we are, uh, because it's just like, everything's like, zing, you know, and mm-hmm. you find out things more uh, faster but the world actually compared to like weird times like 70 years ago could be a lot better if you look at it you know so it's like which my cousin has been reminding me of like hey man like the world's like weird because of technology but like as far as like weirdo shit happening it's always been happening since the beginning of time Mm -hmm. but it's happening maybe a little less or we're trying to like have like better things happen and shed lights on nicer things uh just being more mindful i think overall but as far as your other question too in regards to talking about the music industry and stuff like that like the last thing i really want because i'm a dad is like a price tag on my head be for talking about things that you're not supposed to talk about or not being in the club or marching to the drum of a different you know uh what is it different drummer and like not being part of the program um but i i i just try to i just know what i know and what i've experienced and it's it's not all that different than it ever has been all these years you know there's interesting stuff happening with frank sinatra and how he got plays and his affiliations you know what i mean yeah uh and the same thing has just progressed in its own way within the abilities we have now in technology and 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 the i don't i guess i have no problem talking about it because it's like i think at this point anybody who does know me in the music industry within the inside kind of knows my personality um i feel like i'm trying to um find a little bit more equanimity in all of it as in this last year and just kind of be like lay back a little bit more and be like all right Like, I see what's happening. Okay. And like, because at a certain point, there's like nothing you can really do except kind of like experience it and just 
I feel like the most important thing that people sometimes forget about, like if I could like actually answer this question in a way that it's kind of wise, is that like, I tell people, it's like I'm on the, I, I fought for the Lizzo thing because I thought it was wrong. I'm still in a lawsuit. Hopefully it will work it out. Being in court sucks. It's not fun. No. no. Even get into the details of that, but it's just like, I only did, came out and did that because I thought it was the right thing to do for somebody who might go through my situation in the future or in the past or whatever to try to help like push looking at music and the way modern music is made forward. Um, in that same breath, uh, I really feel like a lot of people are spending lots of time and I'm not saying I'm not on Instagram posting things because it's a business, right? So even for trick gum, I got to post some stuff and promote something if anybody's going to listen to it. Otherwise I won't connect with anybody. Um, but yeah. like, but I feel like people forget about the people a lot of the times that are right next to them. the actual people that they can literally reach out and touch that day. Like neighbors. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> like the person you're going to see today. Yes. People are on there writing all their hashtags. And that's what the next song is called. You're all caught up. The meaning of uh, <laughs> the, next, the meaning of the the next single when we had to say what's the song about. It's kind of funny. Um, I'll just pull up my email real quick. I like it a lot. It's a good one. Um, we wrote this in like November. Um, so where is it? Uh, Elijah. Pure. Uh, those grants and trick them all caught up so for how the song was made you know we're such jackasses it's called all caught up and this uh this was about justin on drums and jordan on bass for the main groove the cousins were toying around with several concepts but kind of tuning in on something boingy and zz top at the point that the song was spanking and the boys were juiced at that time, but there were no lyrics yet. It had been a day bereft of intellect. Justin went for a run inspired by an experience he had with Jordan earlier that day, joyfully unfollowing everyone. And an invigorated Justin came up with the lyrics on a voice memo, the rest is history. And then it said, how the song was made abridged. Justin on drums, Jordan on bass. They were really feeling lively that day. Instrumental came first, then lyrics after. Courtesy inspired, courtesy Justin inspired by a lively run through the hills. And then what the song is about. I've muted everyone, but I still want to share my own opinions. And the point is kind of making an example of myself by saying this. The point is I'm saying the truth. I got to a point that I couldn't deal with it. I still wanted to share my own opinions. I still wanted to share my art, but I couldn't see all the rest of it personally because I couldn't do anything about it. Personally, really, really, in, 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 in my current existence, like I'm trapped in the house in Corona. I got two kids I'm taking care of. I got a wife. I got, I got my mom, my dad, my brother. I got my friend who's in trouble. I got, you know, whatever it is. And, and I think that if people, I would probably get less plays if people uh, get off Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I mean, it, it, it's all a big hypocrisy. And, and that's part, that's part of uh, Trickum is looking at the hypocrisy of ourselves and others. Uh, but I, I would say that, like, you know, it's actually a weird way to answer your question. But like, if people just focused on what they can do in a day, that day for like the people in their lives and or that's why our music is like, it's totally like laced up with things and many ways you could look at the songs that we really won't talk about because even he and I are kind of, we know what it's about, but usually like five or six days later, sometimes weeks later, we know what it's really about to us. Um, and then at that point, that's for us to kind of maybe know since we don't even know what's coming out of us. Right. So, but it's for everybody. The point is that like, we're trying to make music that like is about, everybody want it and enjoying it like you can have different perspectives and views like it's not for a it, we're not making music for a political party we're making music for human beings to connect with other human beings and experience you know what i'm saying 
Yeah, uh, to to use the worst possible reference that I could ever use. I, I remember I was bored out of my mind and sitting in college class one day in history. I was reading this the Long Island newspaper called The Island Ear, and there was an interview with the singer of Papa Roach. And they're asking him about the creative process of Papa Roach. And he said, when, you know, I don't really like to talk about how the songs are made uh, because you really don't want to know how the sausage is made. You don't want to know if a rat fell in that yummy hot dog. Of yeah. Well, I think that is a crude way of saying what you just said, that there's multiple meanings and multiple layers and... I think those are the artists that honestly connect with the most people because that way, I mean, there's Holy Mountain by Jodorowsky, which I love. It's a fantastic movie. I'm not going to watch it every day, but I think that guy's amazing. I'm probably going to watch The Graduate more often. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because there's a, you know, it's yeah. also a great film that's going to, but it, there's more of a reach. So it just depends why you're making music. You're making music for yourself. We're trying to make music for ourselves and for others. And like the whole point is like, we're not trying to start a cult. We're trying to start a religion. But I, when I was on my run yesterday, a community, it's just so easy. Just like, hey, like, that's cool. If you think that shit, like, we'll accept you. That's cool. Like, I don't need to, like, draw lines in the sand. I think there's enough of that in our world. If people want to, like, listen to us and they should be able to enjoy it from all different perspectives. And that's kind of our goal at this point. It's not that we don't have meaning because we actually have a deep purpose, I feel like, between Jordan and I and always have. Yeah. Um, and but you I, started a brand, not a band. Correct. To get that across. <laughs> well, I have to thank you for your time and one of the most honest interviews I've ever done of the thousands of interviews I've done. And it's really great to see you still motivated and creatively inspired all these years later because, hey, a lot of my favorite artists, I would not, their output 15 to 20 years later is not the best. Not the case with you, so kudos. Well, we're hoping, we're hoping, we're hoping to bring, we're hoping to bring the next Nirvana back. You know, we we need some, we need some, we need some, uh, we need some new energy in the pack. Outro cast.
Outrocast. <laughs>